All right, good morning. It is good to be with you in the house of the Lord. If it's your first time here, welcome. My name is Scotty James. I'm one of the pastors here. Delighted, delighted that you decided to spend your Sunday here with us. I'm believing if you apply the word of God to your life today by faith, God, through his spirit, will bring about transformation in your life in a very deep way. So my prayer today, actually I want to open in prayer. God, would you please prepare our hearts, our minds, please remove the distractions, remove the busyness. We want to give you a a canvas that you can work with. Obviously, you can do anything, but we got to do our part too. Transformation is a, is a two-way thing. And so would you help us to clear our minds, clear our hearts, be humble, be focused, that we might provide an atmosphere to, for you to do what only you can do. God, we want to grow. We want to grow today. We want to grow. There's an opportunity for us to grow in grace this morning. We can become more like Christ we can put to death the old man. We can be made whole this morning. This is not just another church service. Wake us up, please. Please prevent us from going into autopilot, professional Christianity. Help us come ready to grow. Transform us, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have a Bible, let's go to Luke chapter 1. Luke 1. Going to be in verse 5. Luke chapter 1, verse 5, reading the Christmas story in the middle of July. <laughs> All right? It's a rarity. <laughs> Are we there? All right, I'll read it. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abihai. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless, because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense, and when the time came for the burning of incense, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. Skip ahead to verse 18. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to you to speak to you, to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happened because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. So let's recap. There's an elderly priest who is serving in the temple and an angel appears to him. And he says, do not fear. What does that even mean? Seriously. What does that really mean? My hope today is that we would answer that question. What does it really mean, do not fear? And how is that connected to walking by the Spirit? You hear this all the time in church. Do not fear. Faith over fear. Do not be afraid. What does that really mean? Or am I just blowing this up and creating something out of nothing? Is it really as simple as that, that you're just not supposed to fear? That if you fear or you feel afraid, you are in sin? Is it really that simple? That's what I hope that we can unpack today. If I could be honest with you, I have a joy of scaring people. It's just something I enjoy doing. And so recently, I had the opportunity to exercise this joy in the church offices. There was a, 
a woman who will remain unnamed, but she is in the room right now, and she was in the church offices quietly by herself. I can't remember what she's doing. She was maybe reading or texting or maybe even praying. doesn't matter what she was doing, but what, what matters is that she was deeply focused. She was intently focused on what she was doing. And as I saw her there alone and helpless, <laughs> vulnerable, I said to myself, you know what? I'm about to scare her. So I, this is a totally true story, so I started to skillfully creep up behind her. And once I got past my first two steps, I knew she was done. The predator was about to get his prey. <laughs> so I snuck up behind her quietly, and I got right behind her head. She still is totally unaware that I'm behind her and what I'm about to do to her. And so in that moment, I had a decision to make because she was sitting there. I said, okay, I can either do this aggressively or I can do this uh, gently and, 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 and graciously. And being that we're at church, I decided it'd probably be more Christ-honoring to do this in a gentle, <laughs> gracious way. And so I got right behind her head and whispered quietly but strongly, God bless you. <laughs> and she jumps out of her chair and almost clings to the ceiling like a, you know, like a cat does. She didn't actually, but she jumped up and she landed and she was all frazzled. And as she, as she lay there discombobulated and disoriented, I just went back to my office and read the Bible. Now, this is serious. Did she sin? The angel said, do not be afraid. Fear not. That's what the angel said. That's what it says all throughout the Bible. Do not fear. Was she in sin? When you go home and you remove the bed sheets and there's a spider, or you see a, a, a snake in your driveway and you experience fear, are you in violation of God's commands? It's a fair question. That's how we see it in the church most of the time. It's a sin to fear. The Bible says it. Zechariah was terrified when the angel appeared to him. And at the end of his encounter, if you noticed, he was punished. He couldn't speak. So it certainly seems like experiencing fear could be wrong. But if you dig a little bit deeper into this, I think we're going to see it's more to the story than just don't fear. It's not that simple in my eyes. There's a woman named Mary. She's the mother of Jesus. And the same angel is going to appear to her and say pretty much the same thing. But it's going to be a, a, a different, different ending to that story. Skip ahead to verse 26 in Luke. Chapter 1, verse 26. It says... In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Listen, Mary was greatly troubled by his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be to me fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Now, whether you realize it or not, these passages were deeply 
uh, charged with emotion. There's all types of emotion in those passages. When the angel appeared to Zechariah, he was terrified. In verse 12, the scripture said that he was completely overcome with fear. He was gripped with fear, paralyzed with fear. So you know, fear is simply an emotion. It's an emotional reaction you have. And so he was gripped with fear. Mary was a, a little different. The same angel appears to her, but the Bible uses different terminology. It says that she was greatly troubled. This is the only part in Scripture where that, that Greek word is used, so it can't say for certain exactly what it meant, but, but I, I gather that she was disturbed. She was uh, greatly disoriented. The angel said, don't be afraid. So she had some sort of similar emotional response that Zechariah had. Maybe not identical, but it's reasonable to say she had a similar emotional response that Zechariah did. Both of them, to some degree, experienced fear, confusion, uh, apprehension, some degree of unpleasant emotion. But what's interesting is they had similar emotional responses, but a different response by the angel. To Zechariah, he was punished. But to Mary, he just let her go. So what's the deal with that? Why did each of them have a similar emotional response, but a different response by the angel? And what that tells me is that the emotion in and of itself is not the issue. It's not about the emotion. It's about, it's about the response to the emotion. It's not about what they felt it's about how they reacted to what they felt. Zechariah felt his feelings, and it led him to, to sin by doubting God. The angel appears to him. He tells him he's going to have a son. And he says, how can this be? Or something along those lines. And he asks for a sign because he and his wife are old. Mary's a little different. Mary feels her feelings, but she responds with curiosity. She says, how can this be? So here's the difference. Because both of them referenced their situation. Zechariah referenced that he was really old, and Mary referenced that she was a virgin. It was highly improbable, highly unlikely, that an old couple could have a baby. It was completely impossible for a virgin to have a baby. That just can't happen. And so what happens is that Zechariah felt his feelings and doubted God's ability. But Mary felt her feelings and wondered how was God going to carry out this plan since she was a virgin. So each of them responded differently to the emotions they were experiencing. And I think this is tantamount to our discussion on what it means to not fear and our discussion on what, how emotions are connected to walking in the spirit in general. It's not about the emotion. It's about your response to the emotion. Emotions are not just psychological responses that, that come within us uh, according to stimuli that we, that we encounter. Emotions are real, uh, uh, deeply spiritual things. There's a real spiritual nature, I'd say, to our emotions that we have to be aware of. God created us as spiritual beings, and our emotions were given to us by God, and they're deeply connected to your soul. They're deeply connected to your, your inner person, and they're not something to be ignored because if you become aware of your emotions, you'll start, you'll start to become aware of what's inside of you because your emotions are really a window into your soul. If you truly want to know what's inside of someone, all you have to do is look through their emotions. Our emotions reveal the inner realities within us. Our deepest affections, our deepest desires, what's most important, what's most significant to us, our emotions will reveal that to us. I'll give you an example. So you have a first-time mom. Any first-time moms? All right, just one. Congratulations. How old is your baby? Four and a half months. All right, cool. So, boy or girl? All right. So, Allie's a first time mom. She's got a four and a half year old girl. In a few years, or a four and a half month girl, in a few years when her baby turns two, she may or may not put her in ballet. And when she goes to that first recital, this is how this is going to go. I'm just going to tell you right now. She's going to see her daughter in her pink tutu. And her daughter's going to do her dance. And the dance is going to be offbeat, off rhythm. She'll probably forget part of it. But when you look at Allie, Allie's going to be overcome with emotion. There's going to be tears streaming down her face. Her heart 
is going to be beating outside of her chest. And she's going to do, it's going to take everything in her to prevent herself from wailing and weeping in the middle of that auditorium. What's happening in her? What's happening is that that emotion is revealing her heart. She loves that girl. She's overcome with emotion because she cares deeply about that girl. She doesn't want that girl to grow up and leave. And all that emotion, all those feelings are revealing what is central to her. Our emotions are a window into your soul. And that, that, that joy, that overwhelming excitement reveals what's in the heart. I'll give you another more negative example. Let's say you have a, a, someone who works for a company. He's worked for the company for 25 years, loves his job, has had great job security, uh, appreciates the culture, appreciates the pay. It's been, a, it's been a good run for him. And then his president resigns, and a new hotshot young guy, 30-year-old, comes in with his skinny jeans and his hipster hair. <laughs> and when that 25-year-long employee sees the new president, he starts to feel feelings. He feels angst. He feels... Uh, discomfort. He can't sleep anymore. He's struggling to focus at work. And what's happening is he's experiencing fear. And that fear is revealing something about his inner person. He loves his job. He loves how things are. He loves the culture. And now this new young hotshot president poses a threat to something he loves, and he experiences fear as a result. In both instances, the emotion that people were experiencing were revealing what was deep inside of their heart. And to take it a step further, emotions are deeply spiritual, listen, which is why they're leveraged by Satan. Emotions are spiritual in nature, and Satan understands that, and he leverages them. Our emotions are very powerful feelings that you experience, and they tend to drive human behavior. Has anyone ever been to a fundraising opportunity, fundraising dinner? Just raise your hand. Okay. When you went to that fundraising event, I don't know, but I'll still guarantee there was probably a nice dinner, there was probably some form of entertainment. Depending on where it was, there might have been alcohol involved. And what they're doing is they want to get you in a good mood. They want you to experience good feelings because when you feel good, you're more likely to be generous. Nobody goes to a fundraising event and has the people yelling at you and putting you through a boot camp workout, right? Because when you don't feel good, you're not going to be generous. That, that doesn't usually go together. But feeling happy, feeling good tends to lead you to do good, happy behaviors. And the same is true of unpleasant emotions. When you feel unpleasant emotions, you tend to do unpleasant behaviors. When you feel negative emotions, you tend to do foolish, sinful things. You feel angry, so you scream at that person. You feel frustrated, so you criticize them. You feel insecure, so you gossip. You feel sad, so you give up. And Satan is behind so much of this. Satan seizes the opportunity presented by that unpleasant emotion and he tempts you to relieve that emotional pain through some sinful, foolish way. Emotions are central to temptation, central to it. So much of our sin, I've come to learn, as someone who's done a lot of therapy himself and sat with many, many people in counseling sessions trying to help them figure out their sin, so much of our sin, not all, so much of it is connected to our emotional pain. When we feel unpleasant emotions, we want relief. And Satan comes in and tempts us to relieve that emotional pain in a way that dishonors God. I'll give you a perfect example. I want you to introduce you to, to Mac, okay? Mac is lonely. Mac is having marital struggles. He and his wife are not on a good page. His wife doesn't look at him like she used to. There's not romance like there used to be there. They're disconnected, and, and Mac feels feelings. He feels sad. He feels 
bitter. He feels forgotten, feels insignificant, and it keeps him up at night. He just wants the pain to go away. So Matt goes to work, and there's a new secretary. And the secretary looks at him, and she smiles at him, and it feels so good. Mac thinks to himself, oh my, I, I feel seen. I feel valued. I, I feel alive. Finally, the pain goes away. And he goes home. And the emotional pain resurfaces. More arguing, more distance, more disconnection. And it's tormenting him. If he could just get this pain and this loneliness away. And he goes back to work. And he sees that secretary again. And she smiles at him. And he thinks to himself, oh, this feels so good. I want this to keep going. And then Satan comes in, seizes the opportunity, and says, well, go get it. Go take your shot. And he does. And he makes a shot. And he has an affair. And we can drag Mac out to the city corner and beat him down and say, you sturdy scumbag, ruining your life with an affair, you dirty, sinful man. Yeah, it's sinful. I'm not downplaying an affair. Always sinful. Always sinful. But if you want to heal this person, you want to get to the deeper root of it, it takes more than just dragging them out to the city square and beating them up. You might want to see what's really going on. And deep inside was this emotional pain that he wanted relief from. And he went about it, tempted by Satan, in an unhealthy way. Happens all the time. I'll give you another example, maybe less dramatic and more acceptable. We accept this, this example more. All right, let's, let's, let's talk about a, a young girl. We'll use a girl now. Name, instead of Mac, let's, let's call her Macy. Macy's a teenager, 15 to 18. Macy consumes a lot of TV, consumes a lot of social media. She sees the influencers. She sees them with their 20 million followers. They've got the hair. They've got the body. They get all the love. Everyone loves them. They're significant. And when she consumes this stuff, Macy feels feelings. She feels insignificant. She feels unseen. She feels insecure. She feels worthless. And these feelings haunt her. She wants to get away from them. She tries different things, but they just get more and more strong and more and more intense. And Satan seizes that opportunity afforded by those unpleasant feelings and tells her, you know, Macy, if you want what those influencers have, that love, then you need to simply just do what those influencers do. And so Macy does. She starts talking like those influencers, joking like those influencers, she starts dressing like those influencers. She starts, she starts wearing tiny shorts that reveal her body like those influencers. She starts wearing low-cut shirts that reveal her chest like those influencers. She starts conforming to the pattern of this world like those influencers. She starts following the trends of society like those influencers. And we see it as acceptable because that's what everyone does. But really what's happening, she's conforming to the pattern of this world all in an effort to ease the emotional pain she's in. She feels insignificant, invaluable, unseen, and her conforming to the pattern of the world is really an effort to relieve this emotional pain. I can give you 50 other examples of how this works. But at the center of it, it's this emotional pain that's leveraged by Satan, and we try to relieve it and get relief from it in some unhealthy way. And this is directly tied to life in the spirit. If we are to walk in the spirit, keep in step in the spirit, if we're to walk in accordance with our new nature that we have, then it will require us to manage our feelings, manage those unpleasant emotions in a Christ-honoring, spirit-led way. So for the rest of our time, which won't be very long, I want to talk about how do we process unpleasant emotions as Christians? How do we remain in the spirit 
even as we uh, experience unpleasant emotions. Because it's easy to walk in the Spirit when you're feeling good, but it's hard to walk in the Spirit when you're feeling angry or you're feeling sad or you're feeling neglected. So we're going to look at a, a, a model of what this looks like. Go to, or write down 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. Again, this is not psychology. This is spiritual stuff we're talking about. First Samuel. should be on the screen if you don't have a Bible. We'll start off in verse 6. There's a woman named Hannah. Everyone say Hannah. Hannah. Hannah's married to a husband named Elkanah. Hannah is not able to have children, which is very painful and extremely painful for a woman in this culture. It's painful today as well. But back then, a lot of your worth was tied to your ability as a woman to produce children. So this was a deeply painful thing. We're going to see how Hannah handles this. Start in verse 6. It says, because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? As we read, I want you to feel the emotion. This is packed with emotion here. Once when they had finished eating and drinking at Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long were you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant you what you have asked. She said to him, May her servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Here we have a picture of what this is supposed to look like, how we as believers are supposed to deal with these unpleasant emotions and remain connected by walking in the Spirit. There's two things you've got to understand, more than two, but two I want to focus on very briefly. Here's the first one you want to write down. First thing you have to do is identify. Identify. If you want to walk by the Spirit... You have to be able to identify your emotions, specifically identify when you are experiencing unpleasant emotion. Hannah was experiencing emotional pain. She says in verse 15, I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I'm in great anguish and grief. So this woman is aware of what she's feeling. She's aware of what's going on inside of her emotionally. And this is where life in the spirit begins with being aware of our emotions, being able to identify our emotions, and listen, I'm going to make a big generalization, but it's, it's, it's the truth. This is where we fall off in the church. We don't make it to step one, much less past step one. We don't identify our emotions because we deny our emotions. This is huge. In the, I'm just being, keeping it real. We don't acknowledge what we're feeling in the church because we suppress what we're feeling in the church. As someone who did this for 35 plus years, the king of it, I'm telling you, I see it all up in here with us in general. We deny what we're feeling because we think suppression of emotion is godliness, and it's actually not. We think denying what we're feeling looks like spiritual maturity when it really isn't. And what happens is we have this wrong assumption. We have this wrong belief. And the belief is this, that those who are spiritually mature don't experience unpleasant emotions. Those who are godly don't really feel those unpleasant emotions. And so with that mindset, we suppress what we're really feeling. We pretend like we don't really feel it. We hide it. 
but it actually prevents us from living life in the spirit. We see these commands like don't fear, do not worry, rejoice always, and we come to the conclusion that spiritually mature people don't feel fear. Spiritually mature people don't feel anxiousness. Spiritually mature people don't feel unpleasant emotions. And in a good, healthy way, we want to be spiritually mature, but we think, oh, well, that means I should suppress that fear and suppress that anxiety and suppress those things and deny those things. But that's actually just not how it works. It's not about the feeling. It's about what you do with the feeling. If I had a dollar for every time I talked to someone who was going through something tough in the church, and I asked them, oh, are you, are you scared? Oh, no, I'm not scared. I'm just trusting. Okay? Or are you sad? No, I'm not sad. I, I can't tell you how many times I've said that. I'm not sad. Going through something sad. Oh, I'm not sad. And what I'm doing is, well, I think I'm not supposed to be sad, so I'm not sad. But here's the reality. You are sad. You are scared. You are feeling that. And you're just lying to yourself. You do feel it, and it's okay. We think it's not okay to feel these feelings, but it actually is. And it actually leads to spiritual maturity. You have to be able to identify what it is you're feeling. And get this, if experiencing unpleasant emotions is wrong and sinful and spiritually immature, then Jesus was sinful and Jesus was spiritually immature because he experienced unpleasant feelings. He experienced unpleasant emotions. Write down Matthew 26, verse 38. Matthew 26, verse 38, Jesus said to them, my soul, my inner being is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Am I misinterpreting this or are you guys seeing this? This is Jesus, the son of God, spiritual maturity to the nth degree, sinless. Yet he experienced uncomfortable emotion. Write down John 11, verse 35. It won't be on the screen. John 11, verse 35, shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Sadness, unpleasant emotion. Write down Luke 19, verse 41. Won't be on the screen. Luke 19, 41. Jesus came over Jerusalem for the last week of his life, and what did he do when he saw the city? He wept. Sadness. Write down John 2, verse 13 to 17. Won't be on the screen. John 2, 13 to 17. Anger. Jesus experienced righteous anger as he cleared out the temple on more than one occasion. If you read through the Gospels, you see that Jesus is quite, uh, quite normally frustrated with his disciples. Oh, ye of little faith, are you still of such little faith? Jesus experienced, from, if, if I'm interpreting the scripture accurately, Jesus experienced all types of unpleasant emotions. And yet he was aware of it and identified it. And so you think that if you suppress your emotion that you're being godly by that? It's a misconception. You're not. I'm not saying you're, you're, I'm not beating you down. I'm trying to bring you freedom. Spiritual maturity is actually being aware of what you're feeling, not suppressing what you're feeling. You got to identify it. And then what do, you have, what do you do after that? Here's the second thing to write down. You identify it and then you surrender it. This is what life in the spirit looks like identify what you're feeling, and then you have to surrender what you're feeling. Hannah's the prototype. Go back to verse, uh, go back to verse 10, please. 1 Samuel 10. I want you to listen for the emotion and listen to the response of the emotion. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 10. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord. You see that? She identified the emotion. She surrendered it to God through prayer. Go to verse 15, please, of 1 Samuel chapter 1. Listen for the emotion and listen for the action, the response. This is after Eli confronts her and thinks she's drunk. She says, not so, my Lord. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. There's the emotion. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was what? Pouring out my soul to the Lord. She identified the emotion. She surrendered the emotion. In her deep sorrow, she brought that pain 
to God. In her deep sorrow, she brought her pain and looked for relief in God. And this is what life in the spirit looks like. You identify what it is you're feeling, and then you bring it to God. Go back to Matthew 26, verse 38. Matthew 26, verse 38. Let's look at the king and how he manages his unpleasant emotion. Matthew 26, 38. Then Jesus said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Look for the action now. Going a little further, he fell on his face to the ground and did what? And prayed. He identified the emotion. He didn't suppress it. He didn't say, I don't feel that. I'm too spiritual to feel that. No, he, he felt his feelings and surrendered them to God through prayer. And this is what life in the spirit looks like. Write down Psalm 46, verse 1. One of my favorite psalms. Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength. Listen, an ever-present help in times of trouble. You know what a refuge is? Anybody know? A refuge is something you run to when you're scared. It's a place you run to for safety and security. It's a place you run to to ease the pain. The scripture says that God is our refuge. God is the one we run to. God is the one we come to when we're scared. God is the one we bring our emotional pain to. But Satan wants you to do the opposite. He wants you to feel that emotional pain and go away from God. The scripture says when you feel pain, emotional pain, you seek God as your refuge. But Satan wants you to feel that emotional pain and seek the things of this world as your refuge. He wants you to feel that emotional pain and go to your phone. He wants you to feel that emotional pain and go to that beer bottle to feel that discomfort and go to that unhealthy relationship, to feel that discomfort and go shopping, to feel that discomfort and go to pornography. This is how this works. This is how this works. Satan wants you to feel that unpleasant emotion and go away from God when the scripture teaches us when we feel that unpleasant emotion, we're supposed to go to God. And when we do that, when we see God as our refuge, what we're doing is we're strengthening, strengthening our union with him. Those unpleasant emotions are actually drawing us nearer to them because we're coming to him through prayer as an act of surrender and as an act of worship. And life in the spirit, if you remember, is all about remaining in fellowship with God. You've got to feel those feelings and bring them to the Lord. And once again, as we talked about weeks ago, I hope you see that life in the spirit, once again, is connected to awareness and surrender. Awareness and willingness. Talked about this a few weeks ago. Life in the spirit means being aware of what God says and then being willing to surrender it. Well, it's the same thing with your emotions. Life in the spirit looks like being aware of what I'm feeling and surrendering it to God. And when you feel that unpleasant emotion and you're aware of it and you identify it and you bring it to the Lord and surrender it, Instead of bringing it to your thing of this world, now you're strengthening your union with him, and that's what walking in the spirit looks like. When you go to the things of this world for your relief from emotional pain, you're walking in the flesh. When you go to God to relieve you of your emotional pain, you're walking in the spirit. This is how, from my perspective, this works. God wants to be your God fully, Satan wants God to be your God intellectually, but he wants the things of this world to be your God practically. So he wants you to think, well, God is my God, but when I'm in pain, I go to this. No, that's, that's, that's a practical, that, that phone, or that whatever, that beer, that, that's your practical God. God wants to be your full God, the one you think is your God, but you actually go to him as your God as your true refuge. So there's a couple of reflections as we, as we close our time. I want to really encourage you so that this isn't just a sermon, but this is something that can actually uh, apply to your life. There's a few things I want to encourage you to do very, very clearly, very directly. One's in your quiet time, one's in community, and then one is, is uh, a separate action statement. Write this down. I want you to reflect this week. Are you aware of your emotions? Okay, really reflect. Am I aware of my emotions? Am I aware of what I'm feeling? Some men, especially if you're tough, it's going to be a, a, a thing that's going to take time for you to grow in. I said for years, I don't feel emotions. I was wrong. 
you do feel emotions. Spiritual immature, you can't be emotionally immature and spiritually mature. Okay? Just so you know. Being, emo- being spiritually mature involves emotional maturity. It really does. It just does. My perspective. What are you feeling? How aware are you of your emotions? Second thing. Are there any unhealthy ways that you seek to ease your emotional pain? We all have ways. We have things we go to to cope. Some of them are healthy, some of them are unhealthy. It's important for us to know, what are the unhealthy ways that I seek to ease my emotional pain? Awareness is vital. Reflect upon that in your quiet time. Am I aware of what I'm feeling? What are the unhealthy ways that I seek to ease that emotional pain? Okay, so you can do it in your quiet time. Community, I want you to ask those questions to one other person in the church. It's vital. You grow not just isolated, you grow in community. So you don't just grow by hearing sermons. The church, being connected to a church, there, there, there's a purpose to that. and it, it facilitates our growth. I want to really encourage you, ask at least one other person this week those two questions. How aware are you of your emotions? And are there any unhealthy ways, or what are the unhealthy ways that you seek to relieve your emotional pain? Those are intimate questions. But here's the thing. It, it'll be revealing. If, you feel, if there's no one in the church you feel comfortable with sharing that with, then you probably need to pursue deeper connections in the church. If you can't ask someone that or share that with someone, the relational depth that you have probably needs to to grow and and deepen a little bit. Okay? So those two things, reflect upon that on your own, reflect upon that with at least one other person, just ask that question, see where it goes. And the third thing is that there's an emotional wheel chart in in your, your bulletin. I want to encourage you to really look upon that throughout the week and start thinking, what am I feeling? What am I feeling? Take at least one time per day. Think through your day, what was I feeling in those moments? That can look overwhelming, but once you become more aware of how emotions work, it'll become more familiar. Within the center of your, of your diagram, there should be six emotions. Those are your core emotions. Happiness, surprise, disgust, uh, uh, sadness, fear, and anger. Everything you feel comes from those six emotions. And then the rest of them are sort of the expressions of it. Those are the meanings you attach to it. So I want you to really think, even in this moment, what am I feeling right now, even as he speaks? Am I feeling surprise? Am I feeling happiness? Am I feeling sadness? Start learning that, okay? So I really, I really want to put to practice that which you're hearing, that which, which, which we're, 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 we're preaching. So do those three things this week. Reflect in your quiet time, process it with at least one other person, and then spend time every day looking at that emotion wheel. And as we do these things and make them our habit, our discipline, I truly believe we'll start to press forward in what it means to walk by the Spirit and become the men and become the women that God really created us to be. If you're going to really walk by the Spirit and keep in step in the Spirit, it will require us to understand what we're feeling and surrender that. So let's press into this this week by faith. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you for giving us, literally giving us your spirit, uniting if we're in in faith. uh, You have given us your spirit to influence us and rule over us and guide us. We want to walk. We want to keep in step. We want to live under the influence of your spirit. And that is deeply connected to our emotions. Would you please help us to become more aware of what we're feeling? Become more aware of what's going on inside of us. And for those of us who have been deceived into believing that emotions are stupid, or emotions are something to ignore, or emotions are something we should suppress because that's what godliness looks like, please, God, help us by by the scripture really reframe what we're thinking. 
if I'm interpreting the text accurately, you, Jesus, were completely aware of what you were feeling. And if you are what spiritual maturity is, then that means we, if we're going to be spiritually mature, we've got to be aware of what we're feeling. It doesn't make us weak. It doesn't make us vulnerable. It makes us more like you. Please reshape our minds. And would you please grow us up? We want to walk by the Spirit. Help us be aware of what we're feeling and then willing to surrender it. Form a people who walk by faith. Lord God, we love you. Please bless our time, our quiet times today. Please bless the conversations that happen throughout the week with other people. May we really take these three things and, and, and apply it, not just dismiss it, but really spend some time trying to apply those three action items. And as we apply it by faith, would you please do what only you can do and transform us from the inside out. It's in Christ's name we pray, all God's people said together. Amen. Amen. How you feeling? I really want to encourage you to, to reflect throughout the week and say, okay, what am I feeling? My little daughter who was in the service just now, she gave me this little thing that says, to daddy from Shay Shay, and she, I don't know, colored and drew some cats and whatnot. What am I feeling? I feel happy. I feel proud. I feel, you know, excited. Throughout the day, I want to encourage you, that's what you should be. I want to encourage you to do that. As you have interactions, as you talk, as you eat, what am I feeling? What am I feeling? How am I as you become more aware, you're going to be able to walk in the Spirit more and, and stay in tune with, with Christ and respond in the Spirit and, and not in the flesh. Amen? All right. If you're new, again, welcome. Stop by our Welcome Center. We have a gift for you. We uh, just want to stay connected. If you need prayer for anything, our prayer team would love to pray with you and encourage you in that. Over the next three or four weeks, we're going to continue to dive into this a little bit deeper. And I, I, I really believe, for me personally, the things that I'm going to be preaching on over the next four or five weeks have been so foundational in my spiritual growth over the past year or so. And I hope, trust it can be the same for you. But you gotta, you got to hear it. you got to believe it by faith. you got to apply it. And, and, and by God's grace, if, if what I'm preaching is true, if it's true, then if you press into it by faith, God will bring his grace and bring deeper transformation into your life. And it, and it might hurt a little bit. But on the other end of it, there's growth. Almost all growth hurts. Amen? If you lift weights, it's going to hurt, but you're going to get bigger as a result. And so let's press into these things by grace through faith, and we'll see you next week.